installment of the hospitality webinar series. Today we've got uh, we've got some heavy hitters in the industry to to share some thoughts on data security 2016. Uh, we've got um, representing Arnold Golden Gregory, Ed Marshall, and then a team of folks from Heartland Payment Systems here. Unfortunately, Michael English had uh, uh, was it Bob uh, Georgia? He had a uh, a travel conflict or something, or he's delayed, so he won't be able to join us, but we do have Bob in Georgia. Um, Michael is fine, uh, just uh, just unfortunately is not able to to get to a phone at this point to uh, to join in the panel discussion, but covering uh, his com his portion of the discussion will be Bob in Georgia, and we're in very great hands uh, with them. So uh, again, just on, on terms of in terms of house, housekeeping, please uh, utilize the chat feature. Reach out to me if you'd like to, uh, to voice a concern, a question, um, so that our panel team can, uh, can field those, those questions. Um, and, uh, uh, but otherwise, please re remain um, with your phones muted. Uh, that's, everyone would appreciate that because um, background noise can really make it a challenge for for everyone else to pay attention. So I will shut up now and hand over the uh, um, hand over the controls to to Ed, who will be our um, uh, will be our facilitator for this uh, for this conversation. Ed, over to you. Well, thanks, Daniel. I prefer master of ceremonies over facilitator, but um, okay. All I'll, right. I'll, I'll take welcome. what I can get. <laughs> take what I can get. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, everyone, for for, for joining today. Um, and I think we'd start off kind of picking up where our last webinar left off, which I, I believe was the Q4 webinar where my uh, partner Michael Burke and I covered um, EMV, PCI, encryption, and uh, tokenization. And I think we're going to start off today doing a little bit deeper dive into EMV and, and challenges and implementation. But for those who may have missed last time, I think I'll start the discussion by just asking, um, you know, Georgia and Bob, could you just let us uh, give us a, a high-level overview of EMV, also known as chip card. Sure, it's Bob here. Good morning, everyone. Thanks uh, for, for the uh, the question. Yes, EMV, um, EMV, as we know, stands for Europay, Mastercard, Visa, and that they're the three uh, card brands that initiated this uh, activity. EMV started in Europe and uh, was primarily a way to move forward from the Max Stripe type of card that we had to a chip-based card that gave a richer interaction between uh, the card and the terminal reading the card. So, so EMV is really about, it's a set of standards that defines how the chip card interacts with the chip reading terminal. And uh, you know, the basis of this is to, to, to create uh, improved security and uh, to provide a consistent platform um, across uh, the different uh, merchants and accept cards. One of the interesting things I think about EMV is a lot of people thought that maybe EMV wouldn't make its way to the U.S. It had been a while since it, since it was released and hadn't arrived here. You know, it's important to the card brands that cards are globally acceptable, so they have to have the same ability in every country around the world to make that uh, a standard experience for cardholders. So that's really the the, the basis of EMV. So just moving, you know, on. As we go through the slides, you know, the next slide, um, I think there's a lot of confusion about what is EMV and what EMV is not. You know, so first thing is uh, EMV is not a mandatory requirement. It, it's up to merchants to make a decision if they need to uh, move to EMV or not. Um, you know, there's been all sorts of horror stories out of the industry that have been put out there, largely by people in the uh, card space trying to use EMV as a method to migrate clients. I, I think the worst story I heard was uh, a restaurant who said that a uh, representative from a uh, processor who shall rena re uh, remain nameless had told them that if they didn't do EMV, because EMV was a federally mandated requirement, they would be breaking federal law and would be liable to go to prison. You know, all these <laughs> stories are, of course, absolute nonsense. It, it is uh, a preference that you make, and uh, it's up to you as a merchant whether or not you do go to that. And the incentive, of course, is that if you don't go to that, um, there are chargeback mechanisms and ways that uh, the card brands 
and uh, uh, issuing banks and acquiring banks will try to persuade you that you should do that. Um, ENV also isn't a replacement to PCI DSS. It lives alongside PCI, which is the uh, uh, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standards. Um, the two fit together well, as we'll see as we go through this slide. They complement each other. They really handle a completely different area. But one of the confusions that came about was often as, as PCI has been introduced, uh, sorry, as, as EMV has been introduced into a country, uh, PCI has said that organizations that accept 75% of their transactions through an EMV terminal don't have to do a PCI audit in that year. And that's something that Visa introduced in their TIP program as a, a carrot to uh, get people to take it on. It doesn't mean to say that you don't have to be PCI compliant. Of course you do. It just means that you don't have to do an audit in that year. Um, there's also no reduction in interchange fees. People think, well, if we're taking on uh, EMV, Shouldn't our credit card fees be lower? Um, no, there isn't any plan that uh, interchange reduces to people that uh, have EMV. What EMV is, is a way of, com of combating uh, a card fraud. So PCI deals with, how, with information that's in your systems, in merchant systems, in banking systems. Uh, EMV tries to make sure that we know who that card holder is that's using the card and we know that the card that they're holding is a real card. So again, we'll get into this in a little bit more detail of how that works, but basically it's a counterfeit prevention measure. Um, it's a global standard, as we said. It's now being widely adopted by card issues across the US. I think it's fair to say that the majority of issued cards, um, credit cards, are now issued as chip cards. Um, we think there's probably approaching 25% of merchants around the country are now using uh, EMV uh, capabilities in their merchant activity. Um, it certainly was pushed out first into the larger organizations, took it on, and it's taking a little bit longer for the smaller tier four organizations to take it on. But gradually, I think we're moving towards that. And as the liability shift um, takes effect, and people start to see chargebacks as a result of EMV, uh, uh, the EMV liability shift. I think we're seeing more and more people coming on board to, to move across there. So I don't know if you've got anything to add to that, Georgia. Uh, the only thing I was going to clarify with the TIP program um, is that Visa has implemented this for all uh, merchant levels, but some of the other card brands do not have equivalent requirements. So while you may be able to waive um, the audit for PCI for Visa, you, you still will likely have to do it for MasterCard. So I just wanted to clarify that one piece because it's right. often a, a point of contention with our merchants, unfortunately, since it's, there's not consistency. It's a great point. And I think you know when you look at the, the, uh, the pass that you get to do an audit, realistically, only Tier 1 merchants do audits anyway. So Tier 1 merchants are those merchants to do more than six million card transactions of a particular type, so these are a MasterCard. Everyone else does a self-assessment questionnaire, not an audit, so it's, it really doesn't have that much impact. So moving on to the next slide, I think a very important part of, of the strength of, of uh, EMV is the way that we authenticate a card and a user. And this is, this is really at the core of what EMV is. And so as opposed to a MagStripe reader where a MagStripe is a very passive device, you know, simply the card is read and the data is then acted on by the point of sale system through the card networks. EMV is a two-way um, device or two-way process where information is read and written to a chip that's on the card and it allows a much richer set of, uh, of uh, business transactions to take place. And at the heart of this is what we call CVM or customer verification methods. So a lot of confusion exists around these aspects and basically what happens when you insert a chip card into a reader is that the card and the reader make a decision based on the type of transaction, the value of the transaction, the capabilities of the terminal, uh, the rules of the issuer, what type of customer verification methods or CVM would be used. And there are essentially um, three different types of CVM that can be used. Uh, chip and pin online. So where the card has a pin um, associated with that, sometimes the issuer may say we want the pin to be entered for a, a sale. 
just about every card that's issued has a pin associated with it, and you'll see that as you get them. But you may not be required to enter a pin in a retail setting or a food and beverage setting. You'll always probably enter the pin when you use it in an ATM. And that's, again, the, the difference that the chip and the, and the reader are making that decision about where the pin is needed. So the highest level of authentication that takes place is an online authentication of pin, where the pin is passed all the way back to the issuer, and the issuer verifies that that pin is the correct pin for the transaction. So that's what's done on you know, the, the, the higher value transactions, higher risk transactions. It's where the issuer has determined that they really need to see the highest level of authentication take place. The next level of authentication is an offline PIN transaction. So in this environment, the PIN is still entered, it's still requested. The, the cardholder has to enter the PIN through the terminal. But instead of authenticating it back with the issuer, it's authenticated with the chip. So if the card had been duplicated with the, with the chip duplication on board, it could pass that but then fail uh, at online authentication. So an offline PIN authentication is a slightly lower level of, of authentication than an online one. Next comes signature. This is what we've been used to and what we see virtually all the time in, in the US. Um, signature verification is really a method to say we're authenticating who the cardholder is um, by virtue of the fact that they're signing and the um, check is taken place by the clerk who looks to see, well, is this signature really the, the signature that's on the back of the card? The people, I think, confuse that. You know, they think well, because signature capture has taken place, it must be good. But just remember, and just as, as it was in the days of a knuckle buster, really the authentication is the fact that someone is citing that signature and comparing it to the signature on the card and making a decision that it is the correct signature. The capture part just gives you some recording that if there is a dispute, you can view that signature later on and say, yes, it, 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 the signature that's captured really was the right signature. And then the fourth uh, customer verification method really is that none of these are used. So in some situations, um, you know, there is no signature capture, there is no pin entry, so the only authentication that's taking place is the authentication with the chip itself. And that still ensures that the card is valid. It's a, it's a card validation, a card authentication. It's not a card holder authentication because you really don't know whether the person who has presented that card is the legal owner of that card. So there are those four methods, and CVM is, an, is a very important part, and it's a dynamic piece about EMV in that just because when you used your card one time, you were asked to perform the validation and verification in a certain way, it doesn't mean that the next time you use that same card, in a different location for a different value transaction, you might be asked for a different verification method. So moving on from there, and as George, you've got the, uh, any comments on that one? I do not. So we've got a, a uh, so just jump in if you if you need it to, to uh, Georgia. So, so looking at the next slide, um, we're talking about the, the different methods of, of security. So we've talked about authentication, you know, the authorization that takes place. And this takes place, um, the, the, the key difference between a MagStripe transaction and a chip-based transaction is this ability that you have for the chip to read and to write information back to the card. Um, it's done through a cryptogram is one of the mechanisms that's done on this. And the idea of this is that if you write a cryptogram back to the card, um, the issuer is track tracking what that cryptogram is. So if there are two versions of the same card in production, very quickly those two cards will end up with a different cryptogram on each. And when one is presented that's out of sequence, out of series, it's a stale cryptogram, we immediately know that this is not the authentic card. And that's the strength that EMV has to detect a duplicated card. It's also the reason why it's so important that for EMV to be successful, everyone has that. Because a MagStripe transaction done with a chip card won't access that cryptogram. And therefore, a counterfeit card can be passed off as a MagStripe card that would have been captured if it was a, a chip-based uh, transaction. There's also other values which are written back to the card. 
you know, we talked about how PIN is stored and validated. Um, there's also a transaction certificate and a transaction counter. So these are other mechanisms that are written back to the card after a transaction and then validated the next time the card is presented. So it's uh, additional ways that we can keep track of the transaction use of that card and detect fraudulent card presentation very quickly. Um, so the, the whole thrust of EMV here is that this richer interaction between the card and the device captures mis, uh, the use of counterfeit transactions very quickly. And that's what leads to cardholder security. And you can hear from that, this is quite different to PCI DSS, which is really dealing with once that information is presented by the card and passes through a merchant system, through an acquiring system, through the card networks, through the issuing bank systems, PCI DSS is designed to keep that information secure and not to let it leak out to someone else. So there's the difference between EMV and PCI DSS and why they go hand in hand together. So moving on to the uh, next slide. Yeah, well, let's, let's just do talk about why why EMV is is so different and such an improvement over technology that preceded it, which is you know MagStripe, uh, which is as Jason Oxman of the ETA likes to say. Uh, it was the same technology people used to use in, in eight-track tapes. Uh, that tells us how advanced we are. Right, and, and that difference really is in this ability. You know, think of think of MagStripe as being a read-only mechanism and chip as being a read-write mechanism. So if you're able to write back to the chip and store information after the transaction, you get that much stronger control of, of transaction integrity than if you're just reading information off a of MagStripe. And, and that's the core of this difference between these two pieces. Um, the fact that you can that you can uh, write back a transaction um, is is good. It also means that's the reason why that card has to stay in the reader until the end of a transaction. And we've all noticed that that when you insert a card, you know, you insert at the beginning of the transaction, and you're asked to leave it in there through the transaction. That's because it has to write back at the end of it. And so if the card is removed prematurely the transaction will be void and thrown away. So this strength is really in the fact that you have you know, the, the capabilities, the abilities to write back to the card. And that's where you can detect a fraudulently used card so quickly. Um, it's where you can uh, really just manage that transaction. The, the downside of all of this, of course, is that all chip cards that are issued today still have a max strike on the back. And that's because of going back to that first statement, the, the the card has to be universally acceptable. So we have to be able to use the card in the chip setting as well as a make strike setting. And you can imagine that only once all machines in the world or all merchants in the world are using chip cards could we possibly do away with make strike. So there's a bit of a of a, a challenge in here is the full strength of EMV doesn't come about until you manage to get rid of make stripes. Now in the UK, for example, issuers are issuing cards without stripes on them. It's going to be a problem when those cards come across to the US and get used because we have such a lower percentage of, of cards of merchants that are accepting it. But in the UK, there's a sense that in UK and Europe, so much, <coughs> such a large percentage of merchants are now using chip cards that it is viable to issue cards without make stripe on it and remove that risk of make stripe um, uh, duplication. Visa at this point has no date to sunset mag stripes completely, so we will see this for, for some time out in the future. <coughs> well, obviously, EMV is a, a big step up from what we, what we had before, but what, what limitations do you see with EMV, and, and how does it uh, relate to other data security mechanisms, whether it's PCI, tokenization, or point-to-point um, -point encryption? That's, that's a great question. and, and you know, EMV is part of the puzzle. It's it's not replacing every other security mechanism that's in place. It's it's part of a of a solution set where EMV deals with authentication of a card, um, as opposed to PCI DSS, which deals with how to protect card data that's flowing through um, the card networks. Uh, remember that um, everyone in the card industry has to comply with uh, PCI DSS. So the merchant has to, the issuing banks have to, the acquiring banks have to, even the card networks have to uh, comply with PCI DSS. And PCI DSS is really about protecting 
sensitive cardholder information that's flowing through card networks. EMV is only really dealing with how do we authenticate that card and make sure that the card that's presented into a merchant setting is a good card. So the two have to coexist. You know, the, the downside about EMV, I think, is that it doesn't, you know, at this point in time, we haven't replaced Max Drive. So still the risk exists, exists that Max Stripes can be cloned. And EMV also still, um, there's no requirement in an EMV card that the terminal that's read it um, encrypts information before it sends it upstream to a point of sale or some other software that's reading it. So those requirements come from, from other uh, protocols, which are security protocols which are in place, like P2PE or PCI. Now, what I think EMV does do is it's forcing merchants to refresh the equipment they have. It's a reason why you have to go and replace the Mac Stripe readers that you've had for years with a new device. And when you get that new device, the advantage is that not only does that new device bring you EMV, but it also brings you probably some form of encryption, some form of tokenization, some more harder um, security stance than you've had before. So EMV is a catalyst to make the change happen that probably could have happened without EMV if people had just taken on tokenization and uh, P2PE more readily. But they certainly all coexist and we're not going to see EMV be the winner and that PCI DSS sort of disappears from view or vice versa, that PCI DSS becomes the winner and we no longer EMV. They're quite different uh, uh, security technologies. Um, in fact, you know, the, the, the truth of it, of, at, it, at the end of everything is a business that implements EMV, EMV must still be PCI compliant. There isn't any sort of holiday from PCI compliance that bringing EMV brings in. It might give you some relief on having to do audits and that's just a little uh, fiducial compensation to say, well, maybe in the first year you don't need to do this uh, this audit. So you can save some money on that because you spent heavily on getting EMV in place. And what about, um, <coughs> pardon me, what about in the encryption and, and tokenization? How does EMV fit in with those technologies? Well, EMV is really dealing with the interaction between the card and the device. So once the device has is doing an EMV transaction, it makes a lot of sense that that device, before it sends information up through the card network, uses encryption to, to ensure that that traffic is, is secure as it's sent. So I know Heartland's stance is that all of the EMV solutions that we put in place have point-to-point -point encryption in the devices. And so that a, a user that takes on EMV with, with Heartland gets the benefit of getting point-to-point -point encryption as well. Um, tokenization is, is dealing with data at rest. So after a transaction has occurred, the, the result of the transaction is that you send an approval message back to the merchant. And that approval message typically handles some form, has some form of token that's used to um, as a method that instead of you needing cardholder to go back and do a subsequent transaction, you can use that token to reference the transaction you've done. So a unique ID uh, as opposed to having card uh, information there. So tokenization deals typically with data at rest. Point-to-point um, -point encryption deals typically with data in transit. And EMV is dealing with the actual dialogue that takes place between the card and the device. And that, as I say, that dialogue is much, much richer in an EMV transaction. If you look at a flowchart of all that happens between a card and a device, I, I mean, it's a very complicated picture that most people are surprised about that, that is happening there, from the, uh, the cardholder verification um, you know, through to, to reading what the issuer's requirements are for how this transaction will take place. There's a lot of, of, of logic built into that transaction that wasn't there previously. And you know, I've heard it described that both EMV and, and tokenization, at least, um, are really focusing on, on devaluing the data to the point that hackers don't really have much, much use for it. It's not, not that great to get the, the one-time use cryptogram off an EMV transaction and grabbing a token won't get you very much, whereas historically, if you're able to grab the, uh, the static data being generated at the point of sale or go into the systems and grab 
raw cardholder data afterwards, you can make a counterfeit card with it. And now with uh, EMV and a cryptogram and a token, you know, have fun with that. Yeah, that's exactly exactly right. If we can lower the value of stolen data, I think we're we're making it less appealing to um, the criminal community to to invest effort in stealing cards because if they do steal the cards you can't use them as freely as you've been able to use them before. You know, it, it's it's very easy to make a Mag Stripe card. You know, you can go to any online store and for less than $100 you can buy a card writing uh, machine that you can duplicate a card from. So if you've got Stripe data, you can create a card very simply. It's a very low cost you know, uh, way of doing it. So it's appealing to, to the criminal world to create those duplicate cards, those counterfeit cards. And there was never really any way of de detecting whether that transaction was a result of a clone of the card or the original of the card. Whereas the EMV technology detects that quickly. If, if we go to, if we take a card that's a Magstripe or a copy of the Magstripe image of a, of a chip card and we take it into a store and try and use it, even if we swipe it, the first thing the terminal says is, well, I think, you know, after it looks at the card and talks to the issuing bank, the issuer says, well, that should be a chip card. So don't swipe it first. Try and do a chip transaction. Well, of course, the counterfeit card doesn't have a chip on it. So you can't progress with the transaction. So the only right, way that you can go to max Stripe with a chip is that you try a chip transaction first. If the chip read were to fail, now you can fall back to using a max Stripe. As, as a fallback method, and, and there's the difference between you know, Mag Stripe in a chip world and Mag Stripe in a purely Mag Stripe world. And I think that explains well, too, the, the, the rationale behind the liability shift that the card brands have put in place, where you know, historically, you get a counterfeit card, you know, at Best Buy, and someone's trying to, to buy a TV with a counterfeit card, the card brands realize Best Buy has no way to tell that card is counterfeit. It was so easy to make counterfeit cards, whereas now with, with the MV, you can tell, and if, if a merchant's not willing to be EMV ready, there's more justification for saying, okay, you know, you're, you're responsible, you're not going to keep the money associated with the transaction that was uh, made using a counterfeit card. So, so how does it look? I mean, it, could you describe just the, the flow of a transaction when you have an environment where you have EMV encryption and tokenization all in place? Right, so in a, in a world where you have EMV encryption and tokenization, the card um, interacts with the chip uh, at a, at a um, card reader level. So the card reader is a secure environment. It, it's exchanging information with the card and it has a hardened perimeter, if you like, on that device. There's a whole, you know, a different kind of standard in place called PTS, um, Pin Transaction Security, which is a set of rules that dictate how that device is manufactured. So that's, that exists whether it's an EMV reader or the old style of Mag Stripe pin debit readers. But you know, this, this unit becomes a hardened unit and you can't access it from anywhere else on the network. So you can have card data in the clear in that device because it's a secure device. But as soon as you send information from that device to something else, that's where encryption takes place. So the data that's sent from that device to the point of sale or up to the Heartland network needs to be secure. Now, in our world, the device sends that information. In most times, it's sent directly from that terminal directly to Heartland. It doesn't pass through the point of sale as a product. It passes straight to, to Heartland. But it's encrypted traffic. And you know, encryption can be done in a couple of different ways. We've seen, for example, um, requirements coming out under PCI DSS that you have to change the encryption method that you're using from SSL to TLS. And the, the philosophy behind that is that you're not actually encrypted the data elements within the device. What you're doing is using a secure protocol between the device and its destination. So you're creating a tunnel and everything that's sent through that tunnel is encrypted. Whereas point-to-point -point encryption is really taking those specific elements themselves and encrypting them. And you'll then actually send it through a secure tunnel that's encrypted, that's using SSL or uh, TLS. And so you've actually got encryption 
encrypting already encrypted data. So you've got that double effect of, of security there, that the transport itself is, is secure. Even if you manage to break through the transport and see the data elements that are being sent, the data elements which are sensitive, car pan, uh, expiry date, name on the card, all of the things that we don't want to see, scribe information, chip information, all of that is encrypted. Once like at the that animal house to, with uh, double secret probation. Right. Once that gets to the, the processor, then um, the token is sent back. And, the, and sending the token back means that the device has now got some reference method that it can use if it needs to, to um, change the transaction. So in the restaurant world, for example, um, we do tip adjusts. So we do a transaction, a sale takes place, and at some point later on, the cardholder is saying, well, like, I'm going to leave a $20 tip. So we now need to do an adjustment to that transaction. So in the old days, the adjustment would say, well, we've stored the cardholder information, so we're going to use that as a reference to the transaction to tell the processor which um, transaction you wish to adjust. In a tokenization world, it's a token that's used that's the reference to that transaction. So there's no sensitive cardholder information that needs to be kept in that device to facilitate that tip adjustment that happens later on. So that's the advantage of, uh, that's the advantage of uh, encryption and tokenization. There's never any card data anywhere except for inside that terminal. And the terminal is a hardened device, tamper-proofed. You know, even if, you, if someone gets hold of this device and starts to unscrew the case to try and mess with it electronically, the device deactivates. And so it, it, it really provides that um, full level of security. Well, you, you mentioned that the need to, to adjust certain types of encryption or, or security standards um, or security protocols when, when doing EMV implementation. And, and I think that's one of the things that we've seen is, is there have been struggles out there in the marketplace uh, actually getting EMV up and running, which is one of the reasons I think we may still be seeing adoption at 25% versus a much higher number. Can you talk about what Heartland is doing to, to help merchants get uh, EMV ready and how what other processors may be doing as well? Sure. So I think the, the, uh, the, the challenge is that EMV, as we've talked about, is a very complicated process. So if a point of sale vendor has to uh, uh, immerse themselves in that level of, of technology and understand it and implement it, it's a long cycle to get that done. Secondly, there's a certification standards that has to, to, to take place in here. If you are the EMV system of record, not only do you have to be certified by the acquirer that's, that's, that's certifying you, but you have to be certified by every card brand whose cards you're going to use. So, so a, a point of sale vendor might find themselves having to do a certification to each processor that they want to send transactions to, and at the same time do a certification to every cloud brand. So Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, for every processor they send it to. So the length of time it takes for them to do that process is, is enormous. And that's one of the challenges I think we've seen in the U.S. and the, I, I think one of the reasons why the U.S. was one of the last uh, countries in the world to adopt EMV was every country before the U.S. had a much simpler processing environment. You know, you take Canada, for example, there's a handful of processors there. You look at the U.S., you've got far more uh, choices. So a vendor that's a point of sale vendor has to go and certify to way more different uh, acquirers than they would have to do in other countries. And so this, this effort becomes exponentially larger. The solution to it is to actually prevent the, um, the point of sale vendor from having to be the EMV system of record. So what Harland has done is solutions which we call semi-integrated solutions, where instead of the, um, the point of sale vendor having to become the EMV system of record. The EMV system of record is actually the terminal that's provided by Heartland. And all of the all the point of sale vendor has to do is interact with that terminal at the business level. <coughs> so let me clarify what I mean by that is instead of you instead of the point of sale actually initiating the transaction and being involved in 
the logic steps that take place through that transaction and directing it, facilitating it, getting the result at the end of it, getting the card information that's the result of this transaction, the, the point of sale simply says to the terminal, I need an authorization for $200. And the terminal does all the work through its EMV application and comes back to the point of sale and says, approve, here's the certification number, oh, and here's a token in case you want to revisit this at a later point. Now, that greatly simplifies the level of work that a point of sale vendor has to do or in the hotel sense, a property management system has to do and, and makes that a whole lot easier than, than previously it would have been. Okay. Um. Well, let's, let's focus for a little bit on the hospitality industry uh, in particular. Uh, what kind of unique challenges does it face in EMV implementation that, that folks in other verticals may not be facing? That's a, that's a great question. So, hotel has, has got a, a, a more difficult road um, than, say, retail. If you think about a retail transaction, it's a very atomic transaction, meaning it's a very short uh, transaction. So, the card is presented, the transaction occurs, the cardholder walks away, that's it. Um, the, the, the challenge that hotel has is credit card is used as a guarantee method. So we haven't even got to tendering a card at this point. We're just really accepting a credit card as a guarantee method for a booking that we're holding that where the guests may arrive six months out in the future. We take advanced deposits where the advanced deposit might be taken with the booking or sometime afterwards and we need to do a transaction at that point. We do EMV at check-in. So once the cardholder arrives at the uh, at the, um, the the registration desk of a hotel, now they're going to do a, a, a new style EMV transaction at check-in. But of course in the hotel world, that's not the end of the story. Um, now there's incremental uh, uh, transaction that takes place. There's extended hotel data that has to be sent where you're actually um, sending the arrival date and length of stay information through to the car brands to qualify for, or through the issuing bank to qualify for the best rate. And then there's checkouts and late charges and of course in the middle of all this, the um, hotel wants to have a policy of making it easier for guests to check in by saying to them, you can do this remotely, you can do this from your phone, you can do this from your tablet, you can do it on the car on the way in from the airport, rather than you actually presenting a car to check-in, which is counterintuitive to the EMV process. So hotel's got a unique set of requirements that really feature around the length of time the cardholder information needs to be stored in there. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing hotel being one of the industries that EMV is slower to, to get into than other areas. So we've seen probably more traction in retail um, and uh, food and beverage than we have, say, in hotel for those reasons. And, and what, what, what kind of solutions have you been able to put in place that have made that integration maybe a little bit easier for this, this unique vertical? So, right. So, so Harlan's gone down two different paths on, on this one. Is First of all, our own semi-integrated solutions allow the uh, a, a hybrid interaction so that you really look at the solution as being two methods of communication. So Harvard has a gateway called Portico, which is what the um, traditional PMS talks to when it's doing a transaction. So some of the some of the interactions that take place still take place with Portico. So the um, incremental authorizations, the checkout, the late charges, the transfer of hotel lodging data take place to Portico just as they have done for several years now. The difference is in just that card present transaction where instead of you having a swipe, you've got a chip read. So what we've invoked is a method of a hybrid approach that says you do the EMV transaction through the device and, and that takes place, that's a piece of new technology that a, that a PMS needs to, uh, to adopt. Um, all of the other types of transactions take place in the way that they've done before. The, the other piece that we as a company have done is to partner with um, gateway companies. So Heartland 
um, recognizes that a lot of hotel customers use gateways to, to pass their transactions from the hotel property management system and point of sale through a gateway to Harden as a processor. So we've been working with gateways to, to um, validate the gateway to our EMV uh, process so that those gateways can actually do EMV transactions uh, at the uh, PMS level and then transfer that data to us. The difference between these approaches is that in a gateway model, it's usually the gateway that controls the EMV device and it's the gateway that really is becomes the EMV system of record. In a Heartland model, it's Heartland that controls the, the EMV device, and it's Heartland's product that becomes the EMV system of record. So there are two approaches to, to achieve the same end goal, the end goal being that the property management system is able to, to do an EMV transaction for those card present elements uh, during the start. Um, <coughs> what else? Well, um. I think one thing that maybe helpful to talk about next is too as well. And I think we have uh, maybe a little bit of background noise here, so if, if uh, someone could push mute, that we would appreciate it. But um, if if you know, obviously data breaches is, is the, the problem. This is all trying to to solve in the day. Can you talk about unique threats that that merchants are facing, and really those in the hospitality industry are facing in particular from from hackers? Sure. And I'll, and I'll go ahead and take that. So I put some information here about um, TrustWave does a really great survey annually, and this is the most recent release for 2015. And these are the top industries. And as you can see, hospitality is in the top three. Um, retail is, is, is well above everybody else, and I think for obvious reasons, the, the number of transactions in retail sector can be, can be very uh, worthwhile for a fraudster. Um, you know, then we go into food and beverage and hospitality, and obviously w within hospitality, food and beverage absolutely can be a part of that equation. Um, and, and I know we did some analysis on our internal records to see what our percentage of hospitality was as well. And um, overall, in, in Heartland, it was a it was in the top two segment. So we know these are, are very strong targets for these criminals because, again, there is a lot of data. And traditionally, um, you know, having encryption, having tokenization within this sector is just is not the norm. So it's a it's an easy win for for lack of a better word. Um, the reality is that about 99% of the cases that we see are related to malware. So some sort of uh, intrusion, either you know, could be phishing or just simply getting in to an open port or an open connection um, into the system. <laughs> now, you know, when we look at some of the postmortems of the largest breaches that have occurred, uh, you know, over the last few years, a lot of it relates to third parties, and that's what we've actually um, seen as the number one threat for 2015 and 2016 is the third party integrations. So it's really important that when you're managing your systems, you know exactly who can touch what and everything is segmented. You know, I, we, we like to use Target because that's an easy one to talk about, but it was through their heating and air conditioning unit, right? So, you know, just the idea that uh, your heating and air conditioning settings are going to be integrated within your payment processing uh, system, you know, seems on the surface to be sort of insane, but the reality is it happens all the time. Um, you know, mm -hmm. systems are archaic, you know, networks were built before these things were really threats, and so it's really important to make sure you understand everything that's touching your system and to try and segment the payment pieces. Um, you know, I, I highlighted here too some of the costs of a, of a breach. So for a small merchant level three and four, and I'm using PCI le levels there, but so these are the, you know, maybe single locations to three or four locations that aren't doing tremendous volume. But even their cost of a breach is, you know, 36000 on average and the high being up to $500,000. So, you know, obviously that's a, a huge level between the average and the high, but it really depends on how many cards have been taken, right? So the card brands each have thresholds where if you meet that threshold, you have a much more significant fine. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's really important to make sure you understand exactly how much volume is going through. And one thing I did want to bring up with the hospita hospitality sector is, you know, a lot of times we see integrations where there's, you know, the restaurant that's on site, um, you know, you may have a separate concessions. There may be different pieces 
of your organization, of the business units that are all integrated. And sometimes they're even run by different management services. We actually had um, a hotel breach that happened last year. Um, wasn't a huge one. But uh, they had a third party vendor who was handling the concessions and it was actually an agreement between, um, so the, the vendor was actually acquired but they never changed the contract language. So the merchant ultimately was responsible for the breach and the loss even though the one managing the system was the concessions vendor, right? So I just know, and we've seen a lot of things like that where there's this stickiness with other third parties um, that just need to be evaluated because it can make a seemingly small breach turn into a much bigger issue once it's uncovered that maybe there are um, there were gaps that were not being addressed or there were systems and processes in place that nobody was really accountable to. When we go into the large merchant breaches, I mean that's, I don't even necessarily like putting numbers because the average is a million, a million dollars and really the high upwards of tens of millions. You know, I, recently we've, we've seen some major breaches at some of the largest uh, hotel chains in the country and, you know, we, we know that's going to net them somewhere tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. Wow. So obviously, yeah, I mean really, really some tremendous cost. And that's just pure fine. Right? I'm not even talking about you know, reputational damage or the cost of lawsuits that you may get from third parties or from clients. Um, or now from the government. Or now from and the government, exactly. Yeah, poor, poor Wyndham got hit with a uh, right. uh, FTC case that actually got some traction. So, yeah, the, the number of, I mean, it, it's really staggering when you look at the, the cost of the breach. And I think that's something that, um, you know, George and I will be talking about more uh, here in a couple of weeks at a, at a different conference, but, you know, it, it's, this is where the liability assessment starts, and that's where the cost starts. But then you have notification, you have remediation um, that you're paying forensics folks for, and then you face just all different kind of manner of lawsuits, whether it's uh, actions by consumers uh, who claim that they have suffered some kind of harm by virtue of the fact their data was exposed, which those lawsuits thankfully haven't gotten a lot of legs for, for good reasons because the car brand rules are so protective of consumers. But securities, class actions, and now uh, we see uh, actions by the Federal Trade Commission. Um, Absolutely. data security. So, so I think the point to, to take on here is that with this risk of breach and the cost of breaches that, that are occurring, the key thing is that when any form of merchant invests in a new technology to handle ENV, they make sure that they're investing in a technology that also brings them point-to-point uh, -point encryption and tokenization as part of that solution. Because the breaches, these, these types of breaches we're talking about, don't occur when you've got that kind of point-to-point uh, -point encryption and tokenization solution in place. All of these breaches have occurred in situations where there is card data, usually card data in transit, moving around a network environment and therefore malware can be introduced to sniff out that in memory or in, in, trans, uh, in, in transit. Moving away from that towards a solution where you've encrypted the, the information in the device and sent encrypted information out of the device means that you know even if someone gets inside the network and starts to look around, even if malware is introduced, it doesn't get data of any value. It doesn't get data that it can use, and that's the important difference. So when you go to EMV, make sure that you go to EMV with tokenization and point-to-point -point encryption. Yeah, that's a great point. That actually touches on two other things. One is you know you're looking at the cost of integration and implementation. You know, it can be significant when you're introducing these technologies, but when you compare it against downside risk of a breach, even if it's not not probable, but but a significant likelihood that that could happen, uh, you're talking about you know ounce of prevention being worth many many pounds of cure. Um, so it could be a worthwhile investment. And the other point I think that you just hit on is, you know, while theoretically it may be possible to, for for hackers to get into even the most secure environment. Um, it is after all an arms race between the good guys and the bad guys. You know, the, the bad guys are lazy, and it's it's they, they like to go after the low hanging fruit. And if you are EMV tokenized and, and encrypted, um, there's there's some other hotel down the street that's going to be a much more attractive target for a hack uh, than your organization. It's just not worth their time. Right. Absolutely, 
and, and, and that's, you know, a huge factor and something that we, you know, we talk with our merchants about all the time is, you know, maybe in this moment in time and looking around and, and evaluating the costs and the likelihood of a breach, it's, you know, um, there's pushback and maybe not necessarily wanting to go forward with this, but to keep in mind that every day your competitors are implementing this technology, the risk just increases tremendously. And, you know, it, it it's, I'm sure for this audience, not shocking, but, you know, just simple searches, uh, not even getting into dark web or any of that sort of area, just pure normal internet, you can find, you know, detailed um, processes of how to get in, which chains are easy to get into, you know, so it, it, and we're continuing to see more and more of that because we're finding people who are going to these solutions that are protecting the environment at a, a more holistic level. So just something to consider that every day that goes goes on, if you are not uh, a hard target, um, the likelihood of the breach just, just increases. So it's um, you know lots of lots of costs to evaluate. We you know it's it's definitely a a burdensome process to move. But but Bob's point is is, is absolutely right on. If you're going to invest in the equipment anyway, might as well make sure you're you're ahead of the curb by quite a while. And you know to be realistic here, by the time we get to a point where the saturation is so high of of merchants using end to end and tokenization, you know it's going to be a long time from now. Um, you know there is some longevity here. Uh, before the fraudsters will have no choice but to figure out another way. Yeah. Well, let, let's it's, it's just because I know we're heading into the lunch hour for some folks, and, yeah. and we don't want to leave everyone with heartburn. Um, why don't we talk about something a little bit less scary than data breaches, which is chargebacks? Uh, and and uh, Bob and Georgia, can you tell us um, what kind of trends you're seeing in in chargebacks now that the EMV liability shift has has happened? Sure. So, you know, we, we have several months of data. The liability shift took place on October 1st. Um, I've listed here some of the top uh, categories of merchants that were receiving the disputes. Uh, petroleum sales, restaurants and bars, and then vending machines. So, uh, while lodging doesn't really crack the top 20 or 10 uh, accounts, I think that's just for reasons of, you know, a lot of the transactions you guys take are prepayments and keyed. It's just a little bit of a different process. Um, we're seeing really restaurants and bars are, are, are some of the ones that are most impacted. Um, and really the high risk areas are uh, pretty obvious, right, pretty, pretty expected. Uh, major cities within the United States. Um, Texas, New York, California, Florida, college towns are really getting inundated, and anywhere where you have a lot of foreign constituents. You know, the reality is, as we talked about earlier, uh, EMV has been in, in, you know, in process for many, many years in different countries, and we have foreign issuers who have just simply been waiting for e, uh, EMV to come to the United States so they don't have to hold the liability anymore. Um, so foreign cards particularly, uh, the foreign issuing banks are, are very keen to dispute transactions that they qualify to dispute. Um, so I, I actually just did some analysis last night to, to look more specifically at lodging. And while we are seeing some disputes, the rate of fraud uh, and counterfeit usage is is really highest at restaurants and bars, and I understand you know uh, when we when we talk about hospitality, a lot of that is included. Um, you know that there are restaurant and bar processing, and what we've seen within the restaurant and bars, and, and this goes back to some of the earlier comments, is you know um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there that the card holders understand the chargeback rules and are actually abusing the system. That's I get that kind of call from my merchants every day. You know. I think this yeah. cardholder just knew I didn't have EMV and so they decided to scam me. The reality is I've personally investigated at least 500 cases and I have not found one that was actually the cardholder. Every case I've looked at has been somebody who bought an EMV card number on the internet and then counterfeited as a MagStripe card, which is what Bob talked about earlier. So when they're using that MagStripe card at your MagStripe terminal, there's no way for you as the merchant or the issuing bank to know if that card has the EMB chip on it, right? The, the, the technology is not there to say, hey, there's supposed to be a chip here. So, um, you know, the merchant immediately loses all of their rights on that transaction because it's an EMB card. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, the reality is this is working. EMB is working. All of these chargebacks, all of this counterfeit fraud existed before. It's just that we've not seen it from an acquirer and a merchant perspective. The issuing bank wasn't going to issue a chargeback if they knew they were going to lose. And if it was a swipe sale and you have a, you know, the signed receipt, you would win. So 
because we're starting to see so many chargebacks, that means that this this fraud existed. It's just now we're actually having to pay the consequences of it, right? And so to me, it's 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 really indicative of how bad this problem has been for a while, but also how we can easily solve it by implementing E and V, right? Then then yeah, the liability just, uh, is. Oh no! Sorry. Go ahead, George. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying that then the liability is right back on the issuer again, right? And so where where it should be, they're the ones issuing the cards. You know, get ourselves in order so that we don't have to deal with this. Um, and I and I don't want to sound like there's tons of chargebacks. I mean, in certain verticals, it, it it's becoming very impactful, and we're going to continue to see more, right? People are going to exploit this. What I like to say is that we're seeing low-level criminals right now, college students who are. Uh, printing out cards in their dorm rooms, selling them for 10 bucks, and then having their friends walk and get some beers, right? That, that's what we're seeing now. But once we start seeing organized groups come in and really capitalize on the fact that merchants don't have EMV, we're going to see some really um, incredible behavior in the, in the next coming months, right? Over the next couple of years, you know, we, um, I'll get into some of the, the trends that I know we're running out of time. Um, so, but yeah, I think, I think trends that impact this industry in particular, I think you've really identified some interesting ones here. Yeah, so um, again, I talked about the, the counterfeit cards being used, and again, it, it, all the cases I've reviewed has been an actual fraudster who's taken advantage of the situation. But things to watch in, within this space would be, um, especially if you have a restaurant or a bar within your hotel, if somebody's using multiple cards. Um, you know, opening a tab and then and then closing that out using a different card that may be a red flag. Suspicious behavior, abnormal behavior, you know, is always a, a good thing to look at. Large orders catering. We actually did have an, a situation with a hotel group that um, was supposed to their restaurant was going to cater to an event, and um, you know everything was done over the phone. And then they came in to pay. They used a counterfeit Magstripe card, um, and so the merchant really lost those funds and didn't really have any recourse at that point except to try and call the police and work with their insurance company. So what we actually recommend is if your EMV system cannot be integrated with your POS at this point, that you may want to invest in a standalone terminal. So just an old school regular single terminal uh, that is EMV capable and hopefully has end-to-end uh, -end and, and tokenization. But at least if it has EMV, that way you can run those transactions through that terminal and protect yourself from those EMV counterfeit disputes. Um, it makes, you know, I, 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 we certainly recommend it on, uh, on a regular basis, but obviously putting a bunch of terminals in the hotel registration area, not quite probably the, 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 the vibe that would be, you know, wanted by the business, but if you have it for catering orders, large events, private events, um, if you have somebody calling in for, you know, a, a large group, uh, a room rates, but they're not actually doing an event, that may be something that you want to then say, hey, let, let's process that through the terminal so that we can mm -hmm. ensure it's actually an EMV card or not and protect yourself in that matter. Um, one thing, too, is a lot of people are complaining that people are using gift cards and that ultimately end up being EMV liability shift. It's the same thing with the counterfeit mag stripes. They're stealing EMV card numbers online. They're printing them on gift cards, what appear to be gift cards, so that it when the merchant's actually processing a sale, they're just, oh, it's a gift card, no big deal, right? So right. again, there's some level of trying to make the cards look uh, legitimate. Um, and then the, maybe the last, I, the last slide we have was, was you know, things that, that folks on the phone can do to protect themselves um, as we're going through this period where um, not everyone has gotten EMV ready. Um, what can they do to, to shield themselves against these kind of counterfeit transactions? Yeah, and one of the best things we always talk about is verification of the last four digits. So um, some, uh, most POSs, you can actually set up a, a prompt that it asks your clerk to enter the last four digits of the card and will actually compare the digits printed on the card with the digits that are actually on the Stripe, you know, the mag Stripe data. And what we find is, again, this just goes back to lazy fraudsters who aren't spending the time to make sure those match. They're just trying to make a card look like it's semi-decent. Um, but when you actually enter the last four in, if you get a no, you know, if you have a no match, that's a counterfeit card, and you, and, you know, obviously you're, you're indicated at that moment, you don't want to do business with this consumer. Um, so that's a really strong one. Comparing signatures, of course, um, also card identification features. You'd be surprised the kinds of cards that people touch and accept that, you know, are absolutely abnormal. You know, they're, they're not the right shape, they're not the right size there's some damage on that. You just want it, to, it, there's some consistency on all cards in terms of there's a logo on it, there's a hologram on it, they're all the same size, the font should be the same on 
the front and back of the card. So they're just features that your employee should be looking for to make sure the card is, is legitimate. And again, you know, it's, it's always about suspicious behavior. Um, you know, if somebody's uh, just a, appearing unusual compared to the normal things you see every day, you guys are, you know, you're in this business for a long time, you know how your consumers act and behave, and when there's abnormal behavior, it needs to be scrutinized. <laughs> If I can just add one thing into there, the, the, the challenge with the EMV liability shift uh, chargebacks is the merchant has no defense. Once it occurs, right. it can't mount a defense and say, look, I, you know, I, I took a photograph of this person doing the transaction, or I checked his signature. None of those things will make any difference. If it's an EMV chargeback, the merchant loses. There is only right. one solution that will prevent a merchant from getting an EMV chargeback, and that's to use an EMV terminal to run the transaction. That's the only way that they're going to end up in a position where they can prevent EMV chargebacks occurring in their business. Well, thank you, Bob, and Georgia, thank you as well. Um, we really appreciate your time and, uh, and the expertise. Um, Daniel, anything to add before we, uh, before we break for the, the lunch hour? Uh, nothing to add. Is there? I haven't uh, received any uh, requests for questions. Um, if this if you'd like to, I mean, it's so much valuable information, my goodness. Um, but if there is something else that wasn't touched on that you'd like to hear, please uh, take, a, take a moment and, uh, um, and alert me, and we can ask that question as long as we have George and, and Bob and Ed on the line. Um, while you're typing that, I, wanna, I just want to say once again to, to, to Heartland Payments to, uh, to be available for this and preparing this this rich uh, webinar. Really appreciate it. Always our same goes to our partners uh, at AGG, Arnold, Golden, Gregory. So thank you, Ed, for, for being our master of ceremonies. Um, <laughs> and if you'd like to share the details, share this webinar, we will be posting it. Uh, I will alert everyone that's here on the, on the webinar. I will alert you of its location on our um, video portfolio. So we do have an archive of of our webinars that are available uh, out there. So, um, if uh, unless I hear uh, I see any questions come up on the chat feature, I will uh, I will bid you adieu. Thank you again to everyone for being here. Uh, we are glad that uh, you joined today. Um, thanks to our presenters. Fantastic work. Thank you so much. Thanks for the Thank opportunity. You so much. Thank <laughs> you.